Alright, so shock. Uh, the way my lofty uh, way to describe this was thoughts on perception and reaching the human hearts and minds through film or filmmaking. And uh, that's what I think is very important, um, especially through documentary filmmaking. And uh, now we'll define it. Shock, a noun. I was sudden, a sudden, upsetting, or surprising event or experience. Like me, when I was asked, I was shocked when Creative Mornings asked me to present WTF. How am I going to get ready for this? All right. So I did it, but I'm here, and I got up in time, which a lot of you guys know is not easy. Um, but as a verb, it's to cause someone to feel surprised or upset. So we think of shock as like fear and stuff like that, but let's just take our steps back and think about what shock really means. Um, for me, before I get into it, I want to talk about my inspiration as a filmmaker. And this came like right out of high school. Um, uh, it was like 2009, 2000, I'm sorry, uh, college, 2009, 2010. Um, Tim Hetherington, he is, has anybody seen Restrepo, the documentary film Restrepo? It's probably the best war film of all time, in my opinion. Um, and it won, it was nominated for an Academy Award in 2010. And um, I was actually at Full Frame that year when Tim was there. And he, I never got to meet him, but um, I knew that his work was, was very compelling. I got to see Restrepo. I didn't get in the screening, but I got like a second look, or he wasn't there. I was really disappointed. Um, but anyways, he, the reason I love Tim is because, um, you know, he was a war reporter and photographer, and uh, the reason it was so impactful for me to see his work is that, you know, he actually embedded with, um, you know, in a war-torn area, the Korangal Valley of Afghanistan, and he was you know, getting shot at with, uh, you know, live fire. He had no idea that in Afghanistan this was going on. And he stuck to his subjects and he, you know, when I saw this film, I was like, these are guys that are like my age. Like, I had a whole new respect for the military because I'm, I'm watching people that are, you know, just like my friend, like Robbie or like Brett, like people my age that could have served or we didn't serve, but, you know, we understand the, and have a whole new respect for what goes into it. And he brought that out of me, and he also brought out the human element of being able to relate to these people and seeing that, you know, you have to really invest yourself, go back and, and gain trust and, and give your time to gain that trust. And that's exactly what he did. And the next slide is uh, in 2007, he won World Press Photographer of the Year with this photo. And I think this is the epitome of shell shock and it's always been something that's been hard to define I mean it's like what is shell shock I, I mean in you know Vietnam War they, were, they always talked about uh, what that was like yeah, sorry and um, but it, it's one of those things where an image it's hard to capture an image of shell shock and this uh, soldier for instance is obviously like what the fuck like he's seen something and he, he doesn't know what to do with himself. He do, he's like disillusioned. And, you know, Tim was there for that moment to catch this photograph. It's not really even in focus, but stylistically it doesn't matter because his brain wasn't even in focus when this happened. So it, it's just this image to me like really resonated obviously with the world because he won. Um, but I take that intimacy of these moments um, and, and actually, you know, embedding with people very seriously to get a good story. Um, so about a year and a half ago, um, a producer named Andrew approached me and uh, wanted to make a film. And our goal was to go to Kenya and tell, uh, and, and we did a Kickstarter and we were successful. And it, the goal was to go to Kenya and tell the story of, you know, the front lines of ivory poaching. And that is, you know, uh, the people on the front lines, the, the rangers, the big life rangers, and the, you know, people in Isiolo uh, who are selling, um, uh, selling it on the black market. And we knew that would be difficult. And our producer did uh, so much pre-production. We put together a team. We went over there. I met somebody here earlier that uh, our sound guy, John Seal, uh, John 
CASB and, and I, we went into it as a co-directed process knowing that we would have to split up, we would have to follow different stories. This was like a goal story. And who knew what would happen when we got there? So um, the next uh, thing I want to show you is the trailer for that. And this is for, we came out with two films uh, from that trip. One is When Lambs Become Lions, and one is uh, The Last Male Standing. And that one is, is one that I'm going to show you again today, and that's about the last northern white rhino in the world. He's a male. And it's the face of extinction, really. And uh, he and his caretaker. So this is When Lambs Become Lions. kwa sababu hii sumu ni kitu ya kuua mnyama ambayo ina tang sabini. Jaribu kubua. Jaribu kuchunga. Sipo kuchunga na kuna je. Ha, sipo kuchunga. Kaona hakuna maisha mengine. Hiyo kitu ndio tuna sasa hivi katika family. Hasa kuna watu kama hao pia tunawatafuta anatafuta wa anamalizia If you wear this uniform you'll be feared They'll say hey this is a ranger So we have to be watchful because we have our enemies We want our future generation to come and see these animals. Without us, they will not see. Uchungu sana watoto wangu wanakula imagine pesa ambayo imetokana ya mnyama ambayo mimi nimemua. Nani aiwan? That was when lambs become lions. Thank you. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about, I have my big gallon of water up here, like I'm gonna. Um, okay, so uh, I think it's it's one of those things where you know this documentary had so much gray area you know it's not like there's the good guys and the bad guys and that's what we wanted to show like they have families they have children on both sides so like how can you define what's what's right and wrong and that's what we wanted to show we wanted to leave the the audience to interpret that for themselves um now with that being said i want to talk about shock in a different way and i think that shock is relative 100 percent to your culture, upbringings, morals, and beliefs. And this is me with Justice and James, two of the guys that were in the trailer that uh, we you know, spent a lot of time with and they were just great. Uh, I miss them a lot. So anyways, uh, uh, Maasai's. They're Maasai warriors, rangers, and they're brought up in this, uh, this world of you know, uh, being a Maasai child that you know, has to slaughter goats. Now. I'm going to show you a one minute video of what we filmed while we were there because once a week, once a month, sometimes once a day, they will kill a goat. And um, it was very shocking for me. I mean, it's like the smells, the sounds, you feel bad for the goat, but you're in there. And I mean, we'll watch it and then you'll see it and we'll talk a little bit more about it. So, I've slaughtered very many goats since I was a very young boy. 
Ya. Okay, so they were eating the fat right off the goat, like right when it was killed, and they were the elders and uh, you know circling them would get the heart, the liver, different parts were given to different people. And they would, they would not waste anything. Uh, they would squeeze out the intestines. And, you know, for an hour we were filming that. And, and for, it had a physical shock on my body because I hadn't eaten in like six hours. And for the next six hours I was there, I was burping. And, you know, when we get back to our, our lodge that we're staying at, I think they like served us uh, ugali with goat or something, and we were just like, man, I can't eat this right now. So anyways, that was shocking for me because I had to be around that, and, it, and I, I became desensitized to it because I was like, I'm here, like, I have to get this. We can't judge, you know, what they do. So for me, that was shocking, but for the Maasai, guess what was shocking? Drones. <laughs> so I'm going to show you a little bit about what they did. I'm gonna turn it on. It's three. just gonna go like this, yes. and then we'll go countdown. All right. One, two, three. Yeah. But I'll, I'll tell you. Okay. So ready? Yes. Don't no, don't I let go. go. Hold on. Okay. One, two, three. Go. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Doing good, man. Yes. Okay, we're gonna fly it that way. All right. You ready? Good job. Good job, So anyways, that was, the, that was the shot we were able to get. Those are the goats that we kind of, you know, ended up being with. Um, uh, before I talk about this beautiful beast of, um, like, dinosaur, uh, I would like to just say, you know, uh, it was, there was so much more with us carrying around, like, ronins, and, I mean, we were just looked as aliens when we would be in these villages uh, because of what we were carrying. You know, we have, like, uh, all these lenses and our iPhones and our laptops and our CF cards and like everything was just uh, uh, blew their mind. Um, so it's really relative to, to where you come from and you know your culture and they you know they're like don't show our slaughter to the ladies in your country they will throw up and we're like maybe but I mean you probably would have if you would have seen like the whole run through. <laughs> Um, all right, so anyways, this is a picture of Sudan and I. He's the last northern white rhino male in the world. There's only four left. And at Old Pajeta, where he is, he's protected. He's separated from the females, and he's the last male standing. And that's what my film uh, is called, The Last Male Standing. And Old Pajeta has actually been, like, uh, hashtagging that. So I'm going to be going back and... Uh, 
finishing the story uh, pretty soon, so I'm excited about that. Here's the poster. Uh, that's Jacob, the caretaker, and uh, that's Sudan. Uh, this photo and, and those last uh, photos were taken by Tierney uh, Farrell, who's a great photographer. She just moved to New York. She went with us and did all the photos behind the scenes. Um, and this photo you just like have to love because, I mean, it's this giant, you know, rhinoceros, the last male in the world, and Jacob just hitting that right spot, and like Sudan's just like, ah, oh, yeah, you got it. <laughs> and so I just had to show that. And the next is the film, and I want to show you the film. Uh, I, I cut this down to like seven minutes last night. It's the world premiere of a rough cut. It's not done, but um, it's at uh, seven minutes, so we'll have to be a little more patient. But uh, I, it's what I'm very proud of, and. Uh, from spending a week with Jacob in Sudan. Kenyans are much interested with the rhinos because they know they are endangered, especially northern white rhinos. Our rhinos is our is like our income in Kenya. So you have to, to take care of them. You have to protect them. You know, there are only five left in the world. And uh, fortunately, we have, or lucky now, we have three northern white rhinos. Come on, I. They like me. Come on, I. I take care of them. Come on, Patu. Patu. Northern world I know uh, it's unpredictable. I can't tell you exactly uh, they will they will exist. As you know, if you are doing work, you are doing to succeed. Still you are hoping that one day one time. You'll be pregnant and maybe you have babies and you'll be happy. And I think we succeed. Sudan is only northern male left in the world and uh, he is 43 years. And you know, a lifespan of rhino is 45 to 50 years. You have to give him, give him enough care. The rhino is healthy because he is eating grass enough. And also, we are feeding him with carrots and peanuts. His age now is. Is going up, so that's why Sudan cannot be able to climb on our, on our female. We, we saw that if they will stress it, so that's why we separated Sudan from them. I'm taking care of great, great male northern white rhino where we cannot see another one in the world. So that's why is our great friend. He's the one, he's the one who pays my salary. I get salary from Sudan. No other way. Of course, I have family. I've got children. Yeah, they're schooling. Some are, some are in secondary school. Last in our primary. So I have to get money here so that they can. School fees, yeah.
taking care of Sudan is the thing that uh, I get, the daily bread that I get to feed my family. That's the relationship between a farmer and taking care of Sudan. We are very lucky, but as I am Jiko, I'm a caretaker, so I have to take care of Sudan day and night, 24 hours. Sudan is the one that people are coming to see before he collapses. It's like a privilege. Give us as a privilege to the world. Sorry for waking you up. No, you are resting. I know he's happy. So when I see crashing the glass, when I see Zundan walking without limping, I feel very great. Very great. And he knows. <laughs> he knows, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we always pray on that puppy. We pray that Sudan to live with us many years as possible because we love Sundan. Mm, without Sudan, mm, uh, my life will continue, but it will be some gap will be left in my in 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 my in high as Jacob. I have to be happy because of seeing him. So there's some, it will be some uh, gap between me and Sundan if I don't see him. But death is nature. Okay, thank you. Um, so that was one week with this animal, and this, this, that was one day at home with his family, and obviously I would have loved to spend way more time there, but I wasn't able to. Um, but I feel like in this film and with When Lambs Become Lions, um, the impact uh, is really you have to reach the people and get empathy out of them. So without going in deep, without fall, watching them fall asleep at night, without watching them poop or take a shower, or like, you know, kiss their like, wife, kids, whatever, I think you're gonna miss some of that personal connection that you can relate to. And so that was the whole goal to, for me as a filmmaker and with everything I do is to get that, like get those moments. And, um, because on the flip side, and the problem I have, I guess, with the media is, you know, when you see this image, it, I'm not a mathematician, I can't, I don't understand really what this is about, I know things are getting worse, but like, this doesn't have an impact on me, my mind, or my heart, this doesn't make me want to react, it, it's, it's sad when you understand it and you look at it for like five minutes and try to like realize, oh God, like, that's bad. Um, but, you know, same with this slide. I mean, this, this is compelling, and you know that a lot of elephants are killed, but, I mean, does it really, does it really make you, like, want to do something? Because you see these headlines all the time, and it's so fleeting, and it just never reaches, um, like I said, our hearts and minds. So, um, it, it, I mean, sometimes it does, like the image with Cecil, the lion, or the child lost ashore in Syria, um, those have huge impact, but the media gets lucky with those images because we consume so much of it and it's everywhere. Um, so, you know, using headlines of shocking verbiage and all that, I just don't think it really has an impact. Like, um, you know, telling, having, asking somebody to watch a short film where you can actually show that there's like humans involved. And 
It's not, the, the animals are in the background, and it's really a, a human thing, because if humans can connect with it, they'll react. So the last thing I want to get to is, um, yes, Miss Louise Gooch. She's sitting right there, and if you could please stand up, Louise. She is a cheerleader, and she is a early 70s, right, Louise? 73. And you can come up here and stand. I need some help. I mean, I've been like a lot. Um, but Luis, uh, I did a Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, story on her because of a Live Fearless campaign they were doing. And we can watch that if you guys still want to. It's only three minutes. Um, uh, but she and I formed a bond while we were filming because Luis, you know, tells me uh, we were we spent a lot of time together, and while I was telling her story, which maybe I should wait for after actually because I'll spoil it, so we'll just screen it. All right. Um. And the gold medal winner for the 2006 state final, the Durham. State It's just something that I always wanted to do. As a little girl, I've always wanted to be a cheerleader. I just think it's the cutest, coolest thing there is. But growing up on a farm and having to be bused, I couldn't do it when I was in high school because when classes were over, then of course I had to take the bus and come back home. My hero was my grandfather. And he would tell me, you can be whatever you want to be in life. You got to do it. I'm 71 now, and a lot of people my age tend to just sit at home, watch the soap operas, and you know, they say, when I retire, I'm gonna get me a rocking chair and I'm just gonna sit on the porch and rock. I'm not gonna sit on the porch and rock myself to death. Being a cheerleader now, you have to stay in the gym. I learned how to do a full split at the ripe old age of 62. Never did a split in my life, was never a cheerleader in my life, and then I retired. And I thought, now, this is the time to start doing whatever it is that I didn't do. Now I have time to do it. Well, didn't work out that way. That was when I was diagnosed with colon cancer. So everything at that point just came to a screeching halt. And we had the surgery and we thought things were going well. It did not. So I said, I'm gonna fight this. I had to keep a positive attitude if I wanted to live. And I definitely wanted to live. So I was ready to fight. The results started coming back, um, cancer free, and I, I, I got my energy and everything back. And when I got it back, oh boy, okay. I became an energized bunny. Yeah. Then I started yeah. thinking, now that you have been given a second chance at life, what are you going to do with it? And that's when I started the cheerleading squad. We are a group of seniors who promote active, healthy living for seniors. Just because you're old, you don't stop playing. You stop playing and then you grow old. So don't give up on the dreams that you had as a child. Keep those dreams and then work toward accomplishing them.
Um, so I guess, um, anyways, I've hit you with a lot today from like goat slaughters to uh, <laughs> diva cheerleaders from Durham who are like early 70s and still doing splits. I mean, I thought this, I, when I heard about Luis, I was like, this is like documented gold. Of course I'll do this story. Like, why wouldn't I? Um, but we, we formed a bond during the time of filming, and I think it's something to be said about that because I had just found out that my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer, and the more time I was spending with Luis and she was telling me about her recovery, she would just give me these, uh, these tips, and I, you know, I would ask her questions relating to the story of her story, but I'd be like, Luis, so like, my mom's getting like, an aggressive you know, treatments of chemo and radiation, and, what is this Herceptin drug? Like, what, what's this all about? And she was giving me tips along the way. And that was like what made me want to come back to her more is because I wanted to relay that information to my mom. And um, it just really became a, an inspiration beyond anything that I imagined um, between me and her. I mean, who could have imagined that we'd be like <laughs> presenting in front of Creative Mornings? about your story and uh, so I, she wants to do a cheer so I'm gonna let her do it. I don't know what it's, I'm gonna stand it. This is one of our routine cheers. We usually have about 12 other senior cheerleaders performing with me. So this time I'm doing it solo. Birdie B, B-R-T-T-O-R-Y. That's the deepest battle cry. I am here to support you. That's, that like killed whatever I said. I um, all right, so I guess really what I want you guys to get out of this is, um, you know, I think there's shocking stories everywhere and however you define shocking, I think it's about perception and how you were brought up and your culture and all that. And I think it's really important to, they're everywhere. So uh, you really should open your eyes and uh, whatever creative tools you have, if you're a designer, a filmmaker, a photographer, a writer, I mean, and I probably left out like 20 other fields that you could tell a really good story. So um, I think it's really about giving your time and patience to get quality material with your subjects. And if you do that, then you're going to actually get your audience to care and then they'll react and they'll, whatever, you know, you're asking for is, is just like feel for me or, you know, feel for these animals, you know support the Durham Divas if you want. You know, like, it's, it's really just about reaching the hearts and minds of people, and I think that's the most important thing when it comes to uh, storytelling and filmmaking is my medium. So, I got nothing else to say. Woo!